working. Hooray. Thanks for your patience, everyone. I'm not Jonathan Patton, but I'm trying to be today. <laughs> um, now, do you know how to do the mutual thing or? Oh, yeah, I can do that. I'll mute you all. Done it. All right. Welcome to lip balm number 55, one short of a complete solar revolution since the pandemic began. Um, today, we have quite an amazing show lined up for you. Um, <clears throat> we have Matthew Zapruder, um, Vani Capildeo uh, from the UK, I believe, uh, Andre Bagu um, from Trinidad, I think, right? Um, and Timothy Gager. Uh, from Massachusetts around the corner. And uh, we welcome you all and we're looking forward to the show. It'll be fantastic. Um, but for, before we move into that, um, I'm going, going to introduce my co-host um, from Australia. Uh, <laughs> Sandra is an award-winning writer, scholar of prose poetry uh, and professor of writing and literature in Melbourne, Australia. Her most recent books of prose poetry are Pre-Raphaelite, Leftovers and Fugitive Letters. She is currently writing a book of prose poetry on the atomic bomb with funding from the Australia Council. Cassandra co-wrote Prose Poetry, an introduction and the anthology of Australian prose poetry. She is commissioning editor for Westerly Magazine. Uh, thank you, Cassandra. We'd love to hear something. Thank you. Uh, so I promised Jonathan that because he can't be here for this one and he's been here for all the others that I would read one of his poems out. I'm sure I can't do it justice. He has that drawl that I can't um, approximate, but I'm going to read his poem and hope that you love it as much as, as I do. So this is Jonathan's poem. Lately, I've been witnessing disasters. Generally, my luck's been different. I've always been lucky, always dodged floods. I can't count the number of times I've arrived in a town that was in recovery or that I've left a town to hear it flooded three months later. Lately though, I've been witness. A truck passes a meter away from me before speeding up into a Mardi Gras crowd. In the subway, smoke rolls through the tunnel into our station followed by icy evacuees. A mail truck flies into an empty elementary school. As I crouch watching, because that's what you do, that's what I do. You do you. You do your best. Lately, I've been exercising regularly at the free gym at the neighborhood center. I've chunked up a bit. I don't mind. A thin body is good for manipulating others, but not much else. My wife and I sit on machines next to each other, reading over each other's shoulders, watching the local news. I haven't seen the local news in a very long time. They do the disasters they do. The treadmills measure heartbeats per minute. If I'm exercising calmly, mine stays at 100, sometimes 110. If I think of something that makes me angry, it shoots to 130 and stays there. I don't see how that's a useful measurement or what I might do in response. I watch it, sure. Most data isn't useful at all. So that's Jonathan's piece and I'll follow by a short two-part prose poem um, because everyone knows I adore the prose poem. So uh, it's called Moon. Part one. The third night we drink too much tequila and you sleep on the edge of my hair until noon. Your body curled around me like a single right parenthesis. I feel your breath on the rounded curve of my shoulder, respiration like a steady metronome. This is my happiest hour. Three quarters of a king size bed behind us, my toes a series of ellipses under the sheet. Two, I feel my mistake in the cold tap of invisible fingers down my back, a beating of words on bone and the slip of invisible breath in cold air. I imagine you fishing in the moonlight, more owl than pussycat, more Hemingway than Huck Finn. The moon sets in a clumsy enjambment of sea and sky. Green fish with spangled scales leap at your feet. Their dying is a thumping of tails. And I'd like to introduce the intrepid Mark Vincennes, who will be hosting the show today. Mark Vincennes is an Anglo-Swiss American poet, a fiction writer, a translator, an editor, a publisher, a designer, a multi-genre artist, and a musician. 
He has published 14 books of poetry, including more recently, Becoming the Sound of Bees, Leaning into the Infinite, The Syndicate of Water and Light, and Here Comes the Night Dust. Vincenza's newest collection, The Little Book of Earthly Desires, and a novella set in ancient China, Three Towers of Tao, or How to Kill a Fortuitous Elephant, are both forthcoming in 2021 from Spite and Dival. An album of music, ambience and verse, Left Hand Clapping, is also forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincenz is also a prolific translator. He's translated from the German, Romanian and French. He's published 10 books of translations, most recently Unexpected Development by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mertz with White Pine, and which was a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in Translation. His translation of Klaus Mertz's selected poems and Audible Blue is forthcoming from White Pine Press. His poems have been published in many journals, including The Brilliant, The Nation, Plowshares, The Los Angeles Review, World Literature Today, Raritan, Asymptote and Plume. His work has received fellowships and grants from the Swiss Arts Council, the Literary Colloquium Berlin, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Witte Brinner Foundation for Poetry, Vincenzi is editor and publisher of The Amazing and Sparkly Mad Hat Press and publisher of New American Writing. He's lived all over the world, from Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the peak in Hong Kong, but he now lives on a farm in rural Massachusetts overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain and where for the regulars who wait for it, there are more otters and stoats and long-tailed weasels than people. So Mark, please read us a poem and host our amazing show today. Thank you, Cassandra. This piece uh, is called Murmurs uh, and it comes from uh, a book I'm working on called uh, a brief conversation with consciousness. More than a year now, the strange crews work two by two as the airplanes drone overhead. Ten plagues of Egypt have descended, but even now to talk of them is strangely taboo. Alligators rise their eyes to the surface and the dome of the sky is the color of pumice. Factory stacks are still puffing away, all in the name of hard science. The scene opens like a newspaper, the landscape scarred in infinite cracks. And just at this moment, a traveler stands in the doorway. You can tell he's committed a crime. His wry grin betrays any last chance to meet the eyes. Go on, he cries, goading the crews of two by two to the prerogative of all. Sound words, he says, solid advice. His ankle boots are shark skin his perfumed hat ripe in a peacock plume, his sheen drenching the air. We knew it would come to this, he says, pulling three brand new bills from his deerskin wallet. One of the most beautiful spots in Northern Ordophilia, he laughs. They'll be finished in a week or two. Then they'll all descend from the hills and flood in here like a plague of rodents. Be ready, he says. They'll all try to fleece you. I nod quietly, staring at the unfinished reinforced concrete. A mouse crosses the street, a vulture circles. Well, thank you everybody for being here today for this wonderful feature. Um, and first up we have Matthew Zapruder. Got to make sure that Matthew un is unmiked. Um, you there, Matthew? I am, yeah. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Uh, Matthew is the author of five collections of poetry, most recently Father's Day from Copper Canyon in fall 2019, as well as Why Poetry, a book of prose. He's editor at large at Wave Books, where he edits contemporary poetry, prose, and translations. From 2016 to 2007, he held the annually rotating position of editor of the poetry column for the New York Times Magazine. He teaches in the MFA and English department at St. Mary's College of California. Welcome, Matthew. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks, Mark. Um, and thanks everyone for um, setting this up. I'm really so pleased to be here. And um, it's really cool to be part of such an international group. Um, that is, we were talking about this before, that is one of the silver, silver linings of a very dark cloud, I would say, a very, very, very unpleasant cloud deadly cloud. Um, so anyway, um, and I want to send 
particular wishes out to Andre, who seems to be on serious lockdown in Trinidad. And I hope everybody's healthy and okay there and that it ends soon. Um, so so stay, stay safe, everybody. Um, I'm gonna read just a few poems from my most recent book, um, which is called Father's Day, like Mark said. And um, then I'll read some new poems and then I'll get out of the way and we can hear the rest of the folks. So yeah, thanks to you all. Um, so uh, this first poem is I, oddly, I wrote this before the pandemic, um, obviously, but came out of it, but it mentions virality uh, and in the context of a viral poem, which always struck me as an odd expression um, that a poem would go viral and that was somehow desirable. I, I, that word always creeped me out even before our, our most recent situation. So anyway, I couldn't help but imagine what it might be like to be a poet who had had the misfortune of writing a, a viral poem. Um, and so this this is this is a poem spoken in that from that perspective, which thankfully is purely theoretical for me. It's called the Blackbird. Can you all hear me? Okay. So, yeah. The Blackbird. I wrote a poem once. I thought it was to be honest, just okay. Then it went viral. Everyone loved it, and soon enough, I almost did too though I also knew something nameless. I pushed down ever deeper. I wrote more, a whole book named after the viral poem. It won all the awards. People even really named a whole conference after it and wept when they even thought about it. It was far too much, so extreme it had to be real what I had done. Now, whenever I try to write, I feel so afraid of feeling nothing. So I just write house and war and dapple. Everyone smiles and says, yes. But really, I just wanna get high and sit on the porch of my heart. Yes, of my heart, that's what I said. Where I can watch the city go by and imagine buildings have feelings. But whenever I close my eyes and try to go there, I only see a black bird with a yellow beak staring at me. I keep waiting, but it just stares back at me and does not speak even one word from the other world. Um, this is a poem called The Privilege of Poetry. I, I don't. I don't know why it is I felt the need to get close to that flame uh, of that word, but here it is. The privilege of poetry. Over someone's shoulder, I read, we should listen to everything. But the more I listen, the more my fingers are lonely in the abandoned house where the absence of music is a kind of music. As the theorist whose name I forgot wrote, and when I read it, it was so wrong, I gasped like all my thoughts had been sucked out into the ocean to crash back in onto my head where the shadow of a wasp keeps arriving. If only I were truly willing to have a little evil poured in my ear, says the politician inside me who will never win. I'm almost too busy to vote. It's just me on those days I'm trying to hear the dark light of a terrarium when it longs to be a park buried underneath pre-human snow so I can tell you which is the privilege of poetry. That's one of those poems you write and you're like, what <laughs> did I just say? But you're kind of, you're sure it's true. You know, you're just like, yeah, that's fucking exactly right. But I cannot, for the life of me, paraphrase it. So I'm just gonna walk away and hope everything's okay. Um, so this, I'll read one more from Father's Day. This poem's called Our Custody. And um, I wrote it um, at the end of, I think it was 2018. Um, there was a press conference of some kind and I blocked out who it was, but it was one of Trump's minions, um, one of his hom homunculi standing underneath a umbrella in the rain talking about how only two children had died in the in, in, in the camps in the south and i remember that i remember just being struck and they kept using the word custody 
custody, you know, our custody. And they, they were sort of bragging that it was only two kids. And of course, this issue continues through the new administration. It's not something that magically got solved, and it's something we all need to keep our attention trained on because it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a human crime. Um, but anyway, I, I worked on this poem for a long time, and this is what um, came out. It's called "Our Custody." This year was serious in a dumb way, and hilarious, like a grave cut into a smile. Dreams constantly died without names. We listened to the earth say nothing and knew everything. The earth, a grave we throw words into. Seeds in a dark Arctic closet wait for the new garden tended by machines. One whose name will become dust said in the shadow under an umbrella, in our custody, only two died. So it was a good year. What can we say? They were children and will always be. Um, some, so a few new poems. Um, I remember when I was a kid, um, I we used to watch this show called The Love Boat. And I don't know, maybe you, you all watch that show, but I remember um, there was this recurring actor, Zsa Zsa Gabor, who would show up. And I remember being a kid and like the reaction when she would show up of all the men was kind of like cartoonishly like excited. And so I knew that she exerted this kind of power over them, but I was too young to like really understand what that power was, you know, that she was like sexuality incarnate or something. Um, so anyway, um, after she died, I wrote a poem called The Empty Grave of Zsa Zsa Gabor. Um, I don't, as far as I know, her grave is not empty, but for the purposes of this poem, it is. The Empty Grave of Zsa Zsa Gabor. On the radio, I heard that inimitable accent say, I want to die where I was born. I remember her so long ago, appearing on certain Friday nights as I religiously wasted my youth, watching others embark the boat of love. Rogues and ingenues disappeared into commercial breaks, unravaged, then into buffet light emerged, dazed with a contentment I've never felt. Some nights she stepped off the gangplank so gracefully, stumbling a little, one hand stretched out to the dashing purser, the other holding the million dollar nickel of always about to escape without becoming a bride sometimes clad in the white fur attitude of a girl from the Kremlin who wouldn't talk to one untouched by evil. At others under a blue hat, a countess of what could have been were I not who I was. She also appeared perched amid the luminous Hollywood square of afternoons, pretending not to know facts about outer space or islands or headless queens her laughter a sentient bell. And never was she until those last days in the hospital allowed to be alone. Then one afternoon, just as she wished, her soul left the body we all desired and returned to the old land. Wind came looking, but could not find her. Um. Yeah, there's a bunch of titles of her movies that are that are folded in there. Million Dollar Nickel, The Girl from the Kremlin. Um, I've never seen any of them, but I'm sure they're all amazing. Um, I'm, some some sabbatical, I'll do. I'll watch them all. Um, okay, this is called Poem Beginning with a Line by Jimenez, which is what it is. It's a poem beginning by a line with a line by the great poet Jimenez. Poem beginning with a line by Jimenez. Like the sea on the telephone, I call you from the other room, a blue iceberg of unwavering attention. You have your headphones on. You're watching a live feed of the dome that protects the city remain opaque. Your handsome thief is happily sleeping. My subaltern is in the forest. He stumbles into a cave holding the stolen vase, holding it out from his body instead of a light. 
There's a little glow. For an instant, we see the paintings, delicate aurochs with alien eyes graze at the feet of the beings known only through their mounds full of fine tools. We still can't believe they made. Cut with perfect precision, when touched by light, they send out an endless chime that if we are still here, we'll bring our doom. In one great cavern, he stands at the foot of a lake. The sound he hears is where water meets the wind and he knows his fate is elsewhere. He carefully places the vase back among the stalagmites. It contains light that will be kept forever. I want to call out to you again, but my mouth will not open. That's what it's like to be married if you've never been married. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll read. I'll read one more. Um, this is called Green Flowers. I grew up. I grew up in Washington D.C. and um, there was one morning when I was just thinking it was beautiful out here in California. I live in Northern California, and it was some you know some horrendous ice storm there, and I was remembering um, remembering what it was like there um, in, in those in those in that weather, and I remember one particular terrible plane crash that happened when I was a kid um, for some reason. And so this, anyway, I wrote this poem. But anyway, thank you for listening. And I'm really excited to hear the other poets and um, I hope you're all doing okay. Green flowers. If I got in my car and crossed the city where I was born, full of dark government buildings, I wouldn't see any life. It is so early there in the East and all the makers of laws and rules are still asleep. Besides, it has been snowing for a thousand years and the ice has covered all our ethical thoughts. I drive toward the bridge the airplane crashed into when I was young. I heard about it on the radio. The DJ made a terrible joke and I laughed and it was like I went one way and can never go back. If I could, I'd stop and get out and look down at my hand where is the wand I was told I would be holding? I'd look at my hand and wonder. It's snowing harder. I look down into the water, then out into the city. From there, I see a banner that hangs from one of the buildings, say through the snow, change isn't possible. For change, I would make myself into a weapon, softer than the grass heart of a meadow. No one is ever found without falling asleep and forgetting all the most beloved ones. In the meadow live the blue bees, immortal and unseen, that pollinate the gigantic green flowers that know I meant no harm. Thank you all. Thank you, Matthew. Fantastic. And next, uh, we have Vani uh, Campbell-Dale, um, who um, is not feeling that hot, so I think she may only appear on audio. Um, Vani was born in Port of Spain, acquiring a love of, tra of traditional masquerade, and lives in Edinburgh. Each of their seven books and several pamphlets explore a new poetic approach from the autobiography in everyone's else's voice of No Traveler Returns from Salt in 2003 to the Calligrams of simple, complex shapes from Shearsman in 2015, and the immersive theater of Skin Can Hold from Carcanet in 2019. Um, Odyssey Calling from Sad Press in 2020 touches on the Odyssey, the Windrush, Buil, Subwin, and Coffee. Uh, Caballero read English at Christchurch, Oxford, continuing on to an MST in medieval studies and a Dr. Phil in uh, Old Norse. Uh, they have received the Chomley Award, Society of Authors, the Ford Poetry Prize for Best Collection for Measures of Expatriation from Carcanet 2016, uh, the Judith E. Wilson Fellowship, <coughs> and the Harper Woods Studentship, University of Cambridge, a Douglas Caster Cultural Fellowship, University of Leeds, and a UNESCO Poetry Fellowship, University of East Anglia. Capaldeo is a short Shimasini Centre Fellow at University Queen's University, Belfast, from 2019 and 2020, and a writer in residence at the University of York. Welcome, Vani. 
Hi everyone, I'm delighted to be here. Um, just going to try reading one long poem and see how that goes. And I'm sorry I see that there isn't any screen sharing, but it's called Odyssey Response. And I was commissioned by an actor who was working with a composer. And this was one of several texts they wove into performance which was highlighting different types of situations of migration. The One of the other poets involved was Yusuf Kazmier, whose debut book is out this year. I strongly, strongly recommend it. It's a book of philosophy as well as poetry. So that's enough for me in terms of me being a human person. <laughs> and I'm just going to read now. Buddy, I've made you a co-host. If you want to share anything, I think that means you can. Okay. Am I sharing the right thing is the question. It looks good. <laughs> Are you seeing Odyssey calling? Yeah. Yes. Odyssey response. Words take wing. Words take wing, fly commonly among all people who have power of health and employment over us. Go like the sparrows, rife on summer streets of a holy island. Unlearn any fear, flitting, bring to mind light and how quickly light fades. Bring to mind life, comfort in houses, fragile as windows onto space. Words take wing as if lawyers were angels, as if death were a paper doll in a set of identical paper dolls, an infinite set of paper doll kings of terror, cancelled by a gentle fiery sword. Sometimes words you launch in many languages, yet before you begin to fly, you are misrecognized, like an owl entering a superstitious person's open plan room being beaten to death athena's wise bird struck down bloody feathers everywhere a soft body a futile piñata releasing clouds could you gather up a faith in strangers in the absence of a god of strangers does any homeless person gleam like a god in disguise disgust rules do without, doing without big symbols. Zeus, eagles may acquire cruel associations. Words take wing, fly commonly among all people who share vulnerability on the trembling earth, who drink or hope drink sweetly cool water. Hero. Tell me how to simplify a song. Tell me about identity, fidelity, solve the problem of a face. Tell me about a state governed by emotion. Would you move, choose to move, if they force you into moving? If you cannot afford to, cannot afford not to. Make a song about one person who can cope. Is it a hero you want? Why not say so? I am suspicious of heroes. How do they survive? I know a mother who scattered her children on the way out of war and has not gone back to look. What if the hero, shining like a falcon, arrives, having traded their body for life, trailing killings and transactional sex? Is the hero empowered to treat their spouse to raw cuts of trauma? Treat them worse and better than anyone else. Help can be a trap. Home a mating of traps. Who do you want at your back? Enough. I am privileged to have civil conversations in a corrected city commemorate the correct dead. How changeable is a hero, like modern rainfall patterns. How fearful is a hero patched like an archaic sail. How lifted up is a hero, like the great-grandchild of immigrants, hurting his parents, hoping his child is kind. Witness those ghosts, 
who after a natural disaster don't know they're dead. Poor wet ghosts trying to board rail taxis home. The sea. Hooves, chevrons, arrowheads, champions, key racers, nothing, no, nothing runs so swiftly, nothing seems to run so, so swiftly as cool water pours back in, making an island of a piece of land once, sometimes no more than another part of the shore, a tidal island, nothing runs so swiftly. Do you think I was singing about death? Should we give death preferential treatment? Should we be women singing to death? You saw, you know, the sea is a cover for bones. Her busyness covers news. New bodies are laid every day in the innocence of the sea. New burdens explode every day in the innocence of the air. How many of my family dropped like shining falcons in the duress of a forced migration? Avering into the sunken halls of the only Atlantis rarely worthy of the name. The sea is a cover. There is a law of the sea. No, the sea is lawless. There's a modern law of the sea. The conference proceeded for nine years. No, it is a convention of the toothless, for the toothless, by the toothless. The sea needs teeth. How can there be freedom of the sea without protection? How can you be territorial about the sea? Most of the civilized America never agreed. Never. Companion, I tremble to think of meeting you. How did we meet on this trembling earth? A blizzard blew up. We sat on a stone a few paces from the farmhouse. We could not see or move go to them. They could not come to us. We could not discern the tide rising towards us. How did we meet? Turned his back on you. I loved the poetry of your anger. I wanted the poetry of your anger on my small island. Transported. Cherished. Forget any other kind of kiss. I tremble to think of not meeting you. You could be better off. Light was fading quickly. You saw. You knew I was unsafe waiting in my full passported femaleness in the cruel associations of a village of privileged abandonment. You sat on the bench, reached beyond death into Persia at your back, unrolled for me a mat of pure imagination, placed for us both a vase of pure imagination. Your metamorphosis was from refugee to host. In the street, you gathered guest right, offered me hospitality where had been others' hostility till my neglectful official friend arrived. We thrived like two birds in an embroidery orchard of pomegranates, oranges, and weeping pears, like impossibilities of climate redemption. They spin epic words to say none of this is home. Hades Social. Be thankful for the friends in a blue and white country who invite you to meet their dead together in a small group crossing the clean smelling river pierced by mossy rocks. Enter among tombs like garden sheds, houses, graves with lost names, granite pitted by acid rainfall patterns. Rub flowerless hands over lost names. Try not home with you. Someone invisible says in your memory, sharpening into many voices, women singing to death. What is this place? How did you get here? You know, graveyards are unclean. The only way to go is by fire open to the sky on fragrant woods, white camphor tucked under your tongue, releasing spirit from the ragged body to the innocence of air. I cannot burn as I need to burn among these new friends. These be glad to meet. Oh. Next time bring flowers. I am sad for my future. 
in a country where my funeral customs are illegal. Whose problem is a soul? Identity? Fidelity? Death is a thief in a stationery shop. He strolls out. The shopkeeper, a poor man, runs after shouting, I saw you! Give that back! Give back what? Death says, strolling out. Hermes is a tram attendant who holds your coffee, helping you find the coin you dropped. It rolls underfoot. The Faces of Odysseus When the trembling earth dips away from our common ancestor, a wife living as a widow may look at the streaks and stripes of another seaside sunset, beauty in isolation and tremble like the earth at the men lined up to land on her like shining falcons, quickly but not lightly. If an old person perseveres in life, yet needing your care, do not harass or tease them as Odysseus did, tricking his father into hard-working tears, washing his brain with real grief and reactive gladness. You know you see Christ in the face of a wounded enemy if you listen to the now celebrated poets weeping what if you hear the song of yourself simplified on the news what if your song is impermissible as the blacked out news odysseus i see you i know i thought i might dislike you you were so hot you planned it standing naked hot in the doorway drawing the long bow no one else could, standing where Penelope could see the slaughter of fine men her hero would commit, war for an indoor Helen. I see you in the face of the vagrant thoughtfully washing his clothes at the standpipe in the savannah, under the tree with no one to care. No one, Odysseus. One man's soldier is another man's beggar, Odysseus. He lives without love or teasing, sweet talk or complication. One woman's king is another woman's case, Odysseus. Zeus, god of strangers, stranger, how are you cast away, cast upon your own resources, cast on wildly different styles of hosting? What if your angry host feeds you up to go to war? What if the gifts lavished on you lay expectations on you to go away, make a success of yourself? and don't come back. What if you are blown back, empty-handed? You would be right to hide your name. Yes? You are a king at home. No? Slaughter and laughter cross your threshold in your absence. Slaughter and laughter at a distance shadow and echo you, no matter how you set off, or your clean presentation now among the elite. Yes? No? Where are you? Islands aren't always islands. All maps are pop-up. Volcanoes yawn, spatter out something the sea covers over. Rivers rise or silt up. Clumps form or dissolve. Barely the size for two blue-coated Norsemen to duel on. Islands are provisional. World whirl. The sea covers over. The queen of the dead lifts in her lily hand with its violet nails a head of snake hair. Do not go too deep. That way paralysis. You want action like tired people do. Stranger, you are cast like in a dream of being on stage, unprepared. Is it right to invent lines? Traveller and body buffeted about as a guest. Zeus loves us. Spirit traveller. Revive as a good host, as you, time traveller. If you see Columbus, shoot on sight. That's epic. There is a city beneath the city beneath the city. Alplane, forget about it. A city is at the back of the city, at the back of the city. Ignore it, ignore the scripts in which mathematics and astronomy were first written, ignore the scripts incised in rock, the scripts inscribed in landscape. Oh, muse, make the poet move on. Memory is no good to triumphant civilizations. 
or amuse your poet as blind, saying life has a sheen, or amuse your poets a hostage, saying land has a meaning. Nobody likes a tryhard, a lace maker working with a vascular surgeon to join delicate gap. Memory in the service of intent. Like tears shared over onion skin, or the cheering faces of the well-fed family watching screens full of migrants plummeting or washed up at a border from a wall. The camera admires gods themselves descended from migrants. The shining chorus of weaponry made manifest by taxes drops death on more children shining and their many lovely languages as if they were done for from the get-go, like paper brochures in a digital age. Forget about it. Keep going. A story has the tricks of appetite. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rani. A story has the tricks of appetite. Next, we hear from André Bagou. Um, who's an award-winning poet and writer from Trinidad, the author of several books of poetry, including Trick Vessels, 2012, Burn from Cheersman in 2015, and Pitch Lake from Peep Out Tree Press in 2017. His poetry has appeared in journals such as Boston Review, Cincinnati Review, St. Petersburg Review Poetry, and the Poetry Review. He was awarded the Charlotte and Isidore uh, Pioneski Prize in 2017. His essay collection, The Undiscovered, An Undiscovered Country, was published by Pea Poetry Press in 2020 and won the 2021 OCM Bocas Prize for Nonfiction. Welcome, Andre. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, <clears throat> I'm really happy uh, to be reading with Vani and Matthew and Timothy. And thank you, Cassandra, Mark, and um, Jonathan Apps and Jonathan for having me. So Matthew's book is Father's Day, uh, but tomorrow is Mother's Day. So I thought I would begin with this poem. The Haircut. I don't remember my first haircut, but I remember who did it. My mother in those days was spry. Her clippers singing a complicated melody setting loose frayed edges, making room for growth, like cutting grass, like cutting cane, my head tenderly in her hands, black hair slipping between fingers, the ears. She can't cut my hair now, and to this man in the noisy salon, my head might as well be a coconut, Nothing precious, nothing he hasn't seen. Salt and pepper threads falling to the tired floor. His blade, a cutlass, thrashing. So I recently wrote uh, a poem about uh, Marilyn Monroe and I see Susanna Case uh, is in the audience. Susanna is co-editing co-editing uh, an anthology on Marilyn Monroe, I Want to Be Loved by You, which is forthcoming soon from Milk and Cake Press. Uh, and I'm gonna read uh, a poem I wrote for this anthology. Mirrors, 1943. The island is 27 miles from the coast of California, half the size of Tobago, with roaming bison and goats, dense forest, unspoilt cliffs, bays of yachts, tranquil as lilies on the blue water. It was fitting she ended up here in a town called Avalon, where instead of Excalibur, her destiny was forged. The house on the hill had a view. Here she discovered the Pacific, his name, was Jimmy. He had the softest hair she ever felt. They would watch the sun, now westward of her west, fall to the sea, where it led she would be. When she packed his lunch for work, there would be a note inside. 
dearest daddy, when you read this, I'll be asleep and dreaming of you. Love and kisses, your baby. Later in the day, she would walk Muggsy among the fruit-bearing trees, his black nose sharp to the directions of life. The day Jimmy left, she cried into the mirror on the wall. 1960. She cried into the mirror on the wall of her trailer and remembered Jimmy and wondered if she'd end up here had he not left her in a desert staring back at something tarnished. But a mirror always lies. She could not see what cameras saw, what certainty, what certainty there was in life was on her face, a big screen that said what she was. What was she? The director called for her and on the set, Mustangs ran wild, each carrying war inside. One, a scaffold of bones, fell behind the herd. The men threw lassos and caught it, tied its bony ankles. Its frenzy gave way to a resigned peace, as unastonished hands turned it into dog food. And she remembered then the flamingos, the macaws, the candy shop, the house on the hill, back when Marilyn Monroe was Norma Jean. And she lived on the island named after St. Catherine, whom the world murdered. Paradise. From his hazel pulpit, Father Murphy condemns her, condemns the green country of her eyes, condemns her silvered voice, condemns the light of her intelligence. What a travesty, he says. What a shame. The movie star who came out as a lesbian. The audacity, he cries, his robe, a fat purple sail, as sweat gathers in my armpits, as the hard pew gets harder, and I try to stop breathing in the cologne of the sweet boy beside me. The mass goes on, but the timber roof above is a ribbed cage, the inside of Jonah's wail, swallowing the air, the candles, the carnival of flowers on the altar, all dragged unwilling to lifeless depths, like the objects that sink into the pitch lake, spat out centuries later, lost somewhere between love the sinner, hate the sin. Later, in my room, the Bible looks funny. My dog paws my leg, rubs his fur against my calf while outside soft frogs make delicate noises. The city is still, the thundering rain has paused. Once in our seas, whales threshed, and before the lionfish came, the reefs were alive with starfish and tongues of every color. And uh, in homage to the flower situation that we have going on here tonight, um, uh, the next poem is called Narcissus. In this white bed, all things are made into a dream in which I fall into a lake, a small pond in which I disappear or am met each day with a new man one with a hair lip, one with accusations, eyes saying no, 
no, mumbling self-loathing. Miramad, I see them through a window that makes itself into a loving opening to some place that is a conspiracy designed to keep me from myself. Who are they? Who are they? Which is to say, after the beating, my world crumbled. I couldn't show anyone my face. More of them began to appear, one with a trust problem, another callous with friends. The shadows of Plato's cave slid up the bedroom wall, the past troubling the curtains, bodies buried among lace. They took my father's watch, which I would wear long after it stopped. My father who knew, who saw, who told me yes, long after he rose from the water, having changed like the ship of Theseus. In rippled light he rose, pebbled tombstones left beneath the surface, marking small drownings, fallen masks, tiny surrenders to the randomness of water to the crystalloid silk of each new body joyfully swum into. And he looked back at me naked and I saw anew. And in this wet circle, I loved him, you. And uh, so, as was mentioned, my most recent book is a collection of essays, uh, The Undiscovered Country. Um, but funnily enough, I do have a lot of poetry in this book and several es uh, verse essays, um, one of which is a visual poem, a kind of erasure poem on Henry James. The remark was strange the house dreadful, it was evening. That same evening, he brought out what was in his pockets, his eyes, his hand, his locked drawer, ice, silence. Then your manuscript, dead, died. He was the most beautiful garden, struck me, told me I could see, came out, coming out, light. I took you, I returned, I knew him, we had him, we had words. And the final poem that I'm going to read uh, in honor of the fact that I'm also reading with Vani Capodio, which we rarely, rarely ever get to do, um, is called The Curse of Eternal Laughter for Vani Capodio. It reached a stage where if she asked me to jump off a cliff, I would. Burnt, so burnt. My room ripped open, made a burial ground for horses and hats and boas. The neighbors laugh, laughter like water, the only riddle that cannot be solved. You cannot be solved like fire, a joy made oral torture the video on my crappy computer is stuck because there is no memory. My floor opens into the US Capitol. Maybe I can stay there and crouch among the tourists, the dark places planned for so long. Your reflecting lake has secret connections. We came to weeping. 
laughter, like light, a small bowl glowing, filled with Himalayan salt, orange flame, a flicker, as the tiny electric tea light with an unstoppable battery blinks. The faster I type, the more music I stop. How could these heartbeats last so long? Laughter, like waves. Even at night, a crashing of nervous glee. Perhaps the ebb and flow of the Gulf of Paria inside me or Sally Bay and the almond tree coast. Salt become my eternal pulse. Laughter rifle me. Explain screams I cannot explain. My neighbors. Riddles with no solutions. They are not riddles. Tell no one whose eyes can bear the light. Okay. So you see, Millie approves as well. <laughs> That's my dog. That's my dog. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. Next, we have uh, Timothy Gaja. Okay, Melly, you already approved. Uh, next, <laughs> Melly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim. A very enthusiastic response to Andre's amazing poetry. <laughs> Tim, Tim Gaja has published 16 books of fiction and poetry. His latest 2020 poems is his ninth book. Uh, Timothy has hosted the successful dialectary series in Cambridge, Massachusetts from 2001 to 2018, and as a virtual series starting in 2020. <laughs> Timothy was the co-founder of the <laughs> Somerville News Writers Festival. He has had 1,000 words of fiction and poetry published, of which 17 have been nominated for the Pushcart Prize. <laughs> His work has also been nominated for a Massachusetts Book Award, the <laughs> Best of the Web, the, the best small fiction <laughs> anthology and has been read on national public radio. Timothy is a fiction editor of the Wilderness House Literary <laughs> Review and the founding editor of the Heat <laughs> City Literary Review. A graduate of the University of Delaware, Timothy lives in Dedham, Massachusetts <laughs> with some fish and two rabbits and he's employed as a social worker. He is currently seeking representation <laughs> for his third novel, Joe the Salamander, a semi-finalist <laughs> for the Holland Prize. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, Mark. And, you know, Billy Collins, <laughs> Billy Collins once said, if you're stuck writing a poem, just stick a dog in it. So I thought that was apropos. Um, thank you, Cassandra, and thank you for Mark for hosting. And uh, it was a real pleasure being able to listen to uh, Matthew, who I've read his work on the page, and it was great to be able to attend a reading and hear him. Uh, Varney, your poem was pure genius. and. Andre, uh, your uh, poetry made me ache. So it's really a, a privilege to be reading with you. Um, I'm gonna read from 2020 poems and all these poems were uh, written and published in 2020, except this last one. Uh, 2020 started, the year started with my mom's funeral and uh, had COVID and then, you know, it ended, which sums up the whole year for me. And uh, I, wrote a poem with my mom when she was in hospice and it was uh, it's the only thing I've ever written with my mom. Near leaves and light. Even the leaves were threatening, the orange ones especially. When she saw, she shivered, felt as if she could pluck the light from the branches. The noise deafening, think about this, think about this. Thoughts more important than words, in those thoughts, God is very near. Then there was singing. To a tree cut down. You can no longer grow. Your roots bore into pipe 
below a basic foundation under my neighbor's house. They watched each branch cut, streamlined, and then saw rope used to pull you down as if you were nothing. I will stand with the tree, protest going down, hope the structure can plumb itself, become an element of changed, not just leaped branches severed, raining down your splendor, becoming dank down to your trunk, your appendages exposed, cut up, taken away, forgotten. Shelter. Remember sunshine smacking away the ugly grays, the everyday ways life is difficult. Even cotton sheets stubbornly refuse to soften hung on the line. We'll never confess we do not wash linen after someone stays over, the sun not given permission to bleach their lovers away, but a sky can turn yellow quickly. Then we shelter safe, wishing to turn tornadoes back into our nirvanas, only to hide behind the rakes standing upright in the basement. Seclusion. We touch each other Desire life's rapidly circulating, going viral, how we used to connect. We disconnect in houses, cold media. We wish to touch each other. Being alone, this is the worst thing yet to be the worst thing yet. Still, there's contact. How we touch each other under the covers is different today. Pictures of primrose are not real primrose. Even the words die, they can't hide. We will not bury them. Um, last year on June 10th, there was a, uh, a protest and parades and protests for Black Lives Matter. And, uh, you know, being a person that can empathize toward that. I, did, I decided to educate myself and I learned that 60 years previous on June 10th, 1960, the chief Nazi party member, George Lincoln Rockwell asked a African-American Dion Diamond to leave a lunch counter, and which got me thinking about Rockwell's picture of the police officer at the lunch counter. And so, uh, I wrote June 10th, 1960 slash June 10th, 2020. Life was simpler when gushed over a 1958 Norman Rockwell, a policeman consumes today's special, a boy, a running away. Thank God he likes pie. The cop only corrupt for eating on the job. We've not moved much since another Rockwell in an incident at Arlington, Virginia lunch counter when a different portrait was painted. The runaway sitting was a Diamond Dion roughly taunted, spit at, cigarettes tossed at, shots fired outside. 60 years ago, exactly the picture unmoving. When we stand up in 2020, we're still all sitting at the counter in 1960, only proving to be a metaphor in a time, never serving a purpose, protesting the way things are, were, are. We're viewing Huskers with Blu-ray specs, gaslight blasts that cause our weeping. This is a found poem from a presidential statement. Guesses from a stable genius. Supposing we hit the body with very powerful light, ultraviolet, that hasn't been checked. Supposing you bought that brought that light through the skin or in some way, you're going to test it inside the body. Supposing there's a disinfectant that knocks it out in one minute, something by injection, almost a cleaning. Supposing you see it get there, doing a number on the lungs. It'd be interesting to check the way it goes after one minute. Supposing that's pretty powerful, the whole concept of the light. Kleptoparasitic, going 
to heaven, tears held back, snared in hell like a fly in a strip, stuck a glue tape restrictive, morphine-like soaring into the pro-zap or skipping Prozac, the limbo of an insect's life is a human antonym, perhaps a hymn of yang and yin stuck within magistry of dewdrops, web affixed, holding a place on earth, unlike the pterodidae, we beg to hold the dying. How Lucia Joyce was treated. There are no structured steps when a chorophy is dismissed, the staged mind is darkened, reject the limitations, movements derived from interpretation of feelings. Rhymes become more fitful, food thrown up, heaved a chair at Nora on father's 50th, fires were set after Ulysses, cut phone cords, disconnect congratulations, Young felt she severed from reality while James had a nasha rubbed in the assessor's nose. Stated, they dove in the ocean to gather improbable creatures, except James twirled to the surface while Lucia spun all the way down, mouth open, giving in surrender to unwilling incarceration. James swam functionally as a genius, cement shoe dance partner, all his weight tied to Lucia. Unformed relief. I took three pills, but they were antibiotics. I saw my mother stare out vacantly from a hospital bed looking for St. Peter. I overeat, I undereat, I never eat. Any more suggestions? Treat yourself to self-care. Do something nice. Call your father who won't remember losing his car keys. He doesn't remember looking for them for two days and we took them, hid them. Did we save a life? Ride the haze of mercury, nowhere to go. We know where to go. Do you know where to go? Tell me where to go. Bonavere on your birthday. Standing felt harmony filling me like music fills earbuds as if it were a matinee lasting until midnight. I nearly toppled down the aisle, floored by the moment, us reaching a ceiling. I'm still not over the wall we scratch at, the surface we pound with unannounced embraces, the synthesizers bursting through staged lights like leaves blasted golden by sun streams, the autumn's impetus hanging on us. Life's canvas. And I, I picked this before we had, we were all winking toward flowers um, earlier, which is very kind of cool. Uh, life's canvas. My heart was a red hibiscus the day it blossomed for you. A hibiscus like a kiss, the red of its lips turn like laughter when considering the Robert Burns painting an easy road the canvas with sunflowers parting like a church aisle. You walked with a bouquet of wildflowers plucked from the random splattering of acrylic. Forever, the Androsas Velosas eyes, beautiful pink. A few days in the Berkshires after Mass Molka. And uh, this is after uh, I saw uh, In the Light of James Turrell um, installation at Mass Mocha. So I decided to use James Turrell as a verb. It was a huge installation. Views strobed total blackness, then the fire pit ukulele terrelled in light and dark. Viewed strobed total blackness, mountain air, stars, terrelled light and dark. 
getting away, not getting out of stars and mountain air. Alone, we would stove the inn, getting away, not getting out. Brooke danced on the floor of a hot tub. We alone would stove the inn, hot like the bottom of a pie tin. Brooke danced on the floor of a hot tub, yelled time when time came today. Viewed of strobed versus total blackness, the fire pit ukulele, terrelled in light and dark like it was a huge installation. Uh, New York Confession. New York was hard to find. Only if I peel the onion, I can pray for sleep to overtake a stumble into place and stumble out. Never saw what's in front of my face. Life's jugglers, clowns, the beat masters of three card Monty. I won until the stakes got higher. In a city of nightmares, morning, afternoon, night feel like different places unless troubled they merged into one. I was awake through all, waiting for the city to let me go. Forced to sing myself to supper by climbing the highest mountains, the trees in the village. On 2nd Street and Avenue C, I was lost, even with obvious nomenclature of the corner. Smack in the middle of the intersection, my arms stretched out. Jesus, 4 a.m., begging for crucifixion. I'll read uh, two more really quick ones. Sobriety. It can exist. Drink coffee, milk, three sugars, stirred with a thin straw. Sit on the sofa, legs curled under, view the oil paintings, hung boats and fields, thousands of brush strokes, thousands. And last, there's a fly in my soup. Waitress pulls a winged insect out from wonton soup, sifts it between pinching fingers, working as a grinder, producing blackened ash, says, not fly, seasoning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Timothy. Much appreciated, it was fantastic. Um, remember, uh, Joe, Joe the Salamander is looking for representation for, for Tim's third novel. Thank you so much, everybody, today. It was a wonderful reading, uh, including Matthew, Vani. Um, thanks so much for coming, even though you weren't feeling up really too hot. Um, Andre Bagu, a wonderful reading, and, and Timothy Gager. Um, and now, uh, before I hand it over to Cassandra slash Jonathan um, on this particular day, I'm going to tell you one more time uh, what's happening in the upcoming events. So <clears throat> the next showcase is the Writing Resilience Showcase, which features Anne Bogle, Lydia Cortez, Paula Churchy, Sandra Clevin, and Meg Tweet. Uh, May 22nd, we have Mags Webster, Jennifer Barber, Shamishta Monte, and Joel Chase. Uh, on June 5, at 7 p.m. Eastern, we have an eco-poetics reading with Gary Snyder, um, who, by the way, had to be coerced to do this, uh, Wong Ping. John Kinsella uh, and Tracy Ryan uh, from Australia, uh, from the Western Australia, and Alison Adele Hedgecoke. And on June 19, we have Molly Gordry, Diane K. Martin, Helen Ivory from the UK, and Fred Marchand. So please join us for those shows. And there are many more exciting ones coming up. Um, and now I'll hand it over to Cassandra slash Jonathan to yeah. do the mic. Yes, don't go anywhere. We have four amazing poets who are going to read a short poem for us in the open mic. And I say it's brilliant every week, but I have a feeling it's going to be a special one today. We are going to kick off with someone that I often call John Wombat Wesick, but I think after the last thing that he read, which I really loved, I might have to change that to John Wonderful Wesick. So John, can I get you to read for us? I think you have a special poem in what seems to be a growing um, curve on people's backgrounds. I that, think that, that's, that, that's, that's right, yes. Um, yeah, well, yeah, last time, uh, Cindy Hockman uh, wrote, uh, wrote this nice poem about Bob Heeman's kitchen. 
And I thought, well, gee, where is everybody writing these poems about uh, Cindy's living room? So I wrote one. I don't really see you here today, which is maybe a good thing, because every time I write a poem about a real person, I, I offend them somehow. So shh, this will just be our <laughs> secret today, OK? Cindy Hockman's living room. Due to the fisheye lens, her face obscures the room except for the blue couch extending to a vanishing point beyond Neptune and a red armchair out in the Kuiper belt. I can only speculate about what's hidden, perhaps a pet copybara named Norman who wakes the neighbors at 2 a.m. by splashing in the bathtub, perhaps the pentagram she used to reanimate Rodney Dangerfield in miniature, the comic kept next to a cup of pens on Cindy's desk and rewarded with an eyedropper of CBD oil for every pun he contributed tributes to her poems. Certainly, there is a Donald Trump voodoo doll. The pin thrust through its heart hasn't affected the real Donald so far. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I hope, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. I might have to pen a kind of background Zoom poem um, in the long lineup of regulars we have. So watch out. It could be any of you. Um, and now we have the man of the kitchen, the man of the moment. I think reducing him to kitchen and cheese is a little unfair because he is a brilliant poet. So Bob Heeman is our next reader in the open mic. So Bob. Okay, hi. Information. What was recorded was not what happened. The car and the train and the trees were only replicas. The path through the forest was not really made of breadcrumbs. And the numbers they found did not really form a sequence. The distance to the mountain grew smaller each time they watched it. And where the woman should have been standing, there was instead a bear playing an accordion. The tune it played was familiar, but not really recognizable. They knew that if they figured it out, they would have their caption. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Never disappoint, Bob. And our next amazing reader is DeWitt Henry, who is one of my favorites. He knows that. Um, and he's going to read a new poem for us today. There we go. Oh, yes. Hooray. <laughs> This is called Heads Up, and it's, uh, I guess, what you'd call a concordance poem. Fathead, hothead, featherhead, headdress, swelled head, head in clouds, egghead, pinhead, bullhead, headstrong, lost head, heads on, theory, hands on, practice. Head versus heart versus belly, which rules the body politic. Heads or tails, heads up, keep your head down, get ahead, head off at the pass, head start, head for the head of the class. Butt heads, go head to head, two heads better than one, undecided or carnival freak. Head over heels over my head. Take me to your leader. Gotta go, where's the head? Headline, headwaters, head of Charles Regatta. Get a full head of steam. Heady, Guinness foam. Good head on her shoulders. Take a new heading, Mark. Know where you're headed. Headlong, headstrong. Can't get you out of my head going out of my head. Sick in the head? See a shrink. Hard head, gone soft. Nod for yes, shake for no. Off with hers. Axe, axe man or a guillotine. Head hunters, shrunken or hired. Crush snakes underfoot unless it serves Athena. Death's head, all in your head. Live in your head, head for words, 
empty head off the top of, took the top off, turned mine, can't get you out of any headway, eyes in back of, going out of, sometimes horned, cuckold, stag, or devil, sometimes asses like bottoms or up my own talking shit. So fast it could make yours spin. I could do this while standing on my head. What's that in the road ahead? Bowed up or tilted back, head rest, head first or jump, buried in sand. That was great. I was gonna say I was head over heels for it, but you got that one in as well. <laughs> so that was wonderful, so playful, thank you. Um, Stuart is up next. Stuart is doing so many books and so many exciting things, um, including um, an anthology of Canadian prose poetry, I think. Um, so I would love to hear from Stuart. Thank you. A pleasure, a pleasure to read here. And I thought um, on, on an afternoon or evening or whoever people are of such great poetry, I would read a poem uh, that I wrote while trying to survive a, 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 an afternoon of terrible poetry. It's called Everything. <laughs> you listen to terrible poetry. I listen to terrible poetry. Rod Steiger listens to terrible poetry. A squashed caterpillar listens to terrible poetry. The town crier listens to terrible poetry. Emma Goldman listens to terrible poetry. The flaming sky listens to terrible poetry. I wrote a poem. I was lonely. I wrote a poem describing how I was lonely. Many a person said I should write a book. The next day I wrote one. I called it a shoe my feet. It was copyrighted. It made my muscles sore to write it. I went to sleep. I dreamed about everything. When I opened my eyes, everyone became very emotional all at once. That was gold. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Thank you. And we have a last person who's asked to read. Um, Sarah uh, has has put her hand up, so I'd like to welcome her. We haven't had Sarah read for us before. Are you there, Sarah? Yeah, I'm here. Um, okay, I'm Sarah Sarai, as some of you know. Pigeon, I'm gonna read Pigeons Are Having. Pigeons are having unprotected sex on top of my air conditioner, upsetting most of my flock who know I run a moral air conditioner at top speed. There's no talking to a pigeon, only arm, arm flappage and a stiff wind. I live by example, which I set, not in concrete with a palm I set, not in jello, though I swoon at shimmerings, vulnerability of women. I ask pigeons protect themselves from the inconsequential and consequential. I ask women. That was fantastic. I absolutely loved that. It's got the killer opening line. My goodness. Thank you so much. That was really fantastic. I did say it was going to be a wonderful open mic. I think it's exceeded all expectations. Uh, Mark, over to you for the wind up. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Sarah, for, for appearing. I, I haven't seen you in a long while. Um, wonderful poem. Thank you. And thank you, of course, tonight for our wonderful feature, including Timothy Gager, Andre Bagu, Vani Capildeo, and Matthew Zapruda. It was wonderful. Thank you guys for joining us and Lip Balm, our 55th episode, one short of a solar revolution, but still pretty close. <laughs> um, to close up, I think I actually decided I was going to read um, a tiny little poem from my old friend, uh, Klaus Mertz, sorry, uh, Werner Lutz, um, a Swiss poet who passed away very recently. And I translated one of his books. It's called Kissing Nests. And this is a very short poem from that. Aha, they surely arose, those sharp malicious tongues directly from the street dirt, way up in a cloud crib weaned on cloud humming. And even further up, into the airless space where all around regard, hindsight, insight, rule, and unchanging sunlight. Thank you so much, everybody, for a wonderful lip balm. 
Have a great evening. And I'll see you next week, yeah? Um, thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Poetry, poetry, love, and happiness, guys. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Love, everyone. Bye, everyone. Love, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much for doing it. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay, I'm going. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Someone has to do it. That's it. You gotta pull the plug. <laughs> Bye. Bye.